Well, thank you very much, and welcome to uh, yet another year of Boomer Futures Think Tanks. This is our fourth year, believe it or not, working on a project of great importance, I think, to the United States and to our city and to our university and other partners, hospitals, city and county uh, partners, too. Uh, it's been a fascinating project, and the great thing, one of the great things about it is we've had just enough money along the way to bring in very interesting people from all over the country who are authorities in uh, their fields who can bring a lot to us. We also have a great group of people uh, at the University of Kansas who we've also invited, and we have others from other universities whom we intend to invite. But I just want to introduce some uh, people in the audience before we talk about uh, Susie Stadler. One of the persons I want to introduce is Susanna Simple Coates, professor of architecture at Kansas State University, who's been following our pro project and working on her own intergenerational community design project at K State for several years. And she's got a great collection of. KSU students here on the KU campus, and I want you to know that I think that is just absolutely, totally great, and I appreciate your coming to Manhattan, from Manhattan to Lawrence, to uh, maybe learn something from us. Usually I'm learning it from you, so I'm glad that uh, at least we have something to offer. Now we have other people who've really been important in uh, this uh, Boomer Futures New Cities uh, project over the years. Our first uh, person who gave us uh, money and help and all along is Lee Foster of the Community uh, Development Corporation, Commons Development Corporation, and Lee uh, is here again today and thank you again Lee for helping us get the start. Basically, all this furniture came from one of his contributions, and some of our, welcome, welcome, we have some seats here, even one up front uh, for any of you who uh, are interested in coming up front. So, uh, the only way this goes is if we can get support either through foundation grants, research grants, and um, people who are interested in what we do. Now, about last March, I began to see someone come to this uh, think tank and the second time he came to this think tank he came up to me and said well I really like what you are doing and I'd like to make a contribution to this process and that Pat Peary Pat Peary of Lane 4 uh, Development Property Group in Kansas City and because of his contribution we can continue on this year so you know we make quarters out of nickels. If you give us a nickel, we can really get uh, the value out of it. But uh, getting that kind of contribution and support from lots of people uh, is very important to us. There are many people here. Otherwise, hi, Scott. Uh, I could introduce. Uh, but uh, we are really here to uh, meet and hear Susie Stadler out of Berkeley. Uh, an architect who uh, has been working in the field for quite a number of years. She uh, comes from Austria and has been in the United States working for over 30 years. Uh, she has about 15 years of experience in the kind of architectural design work that uh, she's doing. She also uh, is a financial person. She has a master's degree in architecture from Berkeley and an MBA from Berkeley as well. So we have an architect here who does pay attention to how much things cost, which is not always the case from <laughs> among all architects. So it's always good to have a pragmatist as well. So she's the prime architect and principal designer and uh, if her own firm and uh, works as a consultant with other firms. She is a co-founder of a um, interdisciplinary uh, group called at home with growing old. Uh, she's done any number of private residences, spaces for education and youth, uh, age-friendly environments, and senior housing. That's what really brings us here today uh, with Susie because she is going to talk about um, uh, outdoor spaces. 
outdoor spaces. There it is, outside places for people. And we are working on a uh, intergenerational community project here in Lawrence, and uh, it's moving along uh, in the right direction with, oh, I think, all the right people, uh, if we can put it together. And one of the things we're investigating is what's the meaning of an interdisciplinary place, or of an intergenerational place for all kinds of people. And so uh, Susie Stadler is our expert architect uh, today from California, and we know that California always leads the way, and we hope that um, we can bring you back here again soon to help us. Because it's, we have to foster an intergenerational solidarity in order for all of us to grow old in dignity. And that's sort of the secret we all are growing old. At, at one time, sooner or later, we want to have an environment we feel comfortable in feel, and which is beautiful to us. So what I'm going to talk about is um, not only the ability to go outside, but also how the world will come to us as we grow old. And I want to say a little bit about the term um, at home with growing old, uh, as opposed to age friendly or aging in place or aging in community. Uh, this was the title of my architectural thesis many, many years ago. And uh, I thought about it long and hard. At home was growing old. Uh, what I understand, what I wanted to express with it is that at home was growing old is not only finding a home which fits us and supports us in older age, but also be emotionally at home. And I think what often happens is that designers overlook that growing old is hard work. And it's not only hard work um, physically, but it's also emotionally hard work. And we have to, as designers, respond to that. Can I move this camera? With mouse. 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 Oh. for though. Um, demographically, age doesn't really say that much anymore who we are and what our needs are at a certain time in life. <coughs> Once upon a time, there was a much clearer distinction what happens at what point in our life, from education to working life to retirement. But as you all know, this is shifting. Somebody with 70 might be in the midst of their so-called encore career, a second career, or they might be in a nursing home uh, needing to, God, <laughs> needing to take care of the hip surgery, or they might be the governor of California. So there's like a wide range of needs, and I think we have to, the fluidity of what it means to, be, uh, to grow old also has to be Taking, uh, taking into account when we design for, um, for this part of life. And of course, how we feel very much depends on how we lived our life, on our income level, lifestyle, and on our health. So at home, we're growing old really means 
maintain a sense of belonging, even a sense of belonging, you know, after we retire, after we might, might have to move or want to move, what is the sense of belonging, the sense of familiar, familiarity, being part of a group? It's also about maintaining a sense of self, staying who we are, even if certain things change, and a sense of purpose, which is very, very important. How can we continue to contribute? That's what makes aging healthy aging. And the symbol of this for many of us is the archetypal village. Who hasn't dreamt of walking in a sun-drenched Andalusian village, you know, going across the street to the baker, and buying fresh bread in the morning, um, <coughs> or knocking on the door of the neighbor? This is sort of what we all dream when we think of community. And of course, there is, um, you know, and of course, this, you know, here we live very differently. And sometimes I think um, there is the um, seduction or the, the incentive to recreate the image uh, of such a village and think that this makes community, but this doesn't really make community. We have to figure out ourselves how we can design for community. Sorry, this is just really annoying. Can this be fixed? This is. Um, how can we design for community in the framework of our society? And what I also want to mention in this uh, context is that the, the hardware of the village, the buildings, the streets, the balconies, etc., that in addition to the hardware, there's of course software necessary. And uh, the software of programs, social programs, etc., and I will go into this more a little later on, but I want to mention in this context the village movement, which I think maybe, who is familiar with the village movement in here? Yeah. So the, the village movement is basically a grassroots, I just say quickly because I think it's important to mention it in this context, is a grassroots movement which started in Boston, and it's basically a um, it basically connects all the adults in the neighborhood, and it's a self-help group. They help each other, but they also um, come together as a group to share resources and get basic services from their village group, like if you need a ride to the doctor or something like this. So the image of the village also works, or they also have adopted the image of the village for their sense of community. So you have here embarked on an incredibly innovative and uh, important concept, the intergenerational village, the campus village. And I know that this is very preliminary, but I don't know, for, for not all people might be familiar with the compartment or with the components of this village. And there's family housing, um, senior living, university and medical basically these are the these are the main parts and how how these parts come together and intertwine this is really um, is a challenge and a, an incredible opportunity so i hope that this talk can contribute to making these notes or understanding these notes of connection and i apologize for this but that's the way it is so let me, let me talk a little bit what's really happening in this country. Um, how are we living? Are we living alone and together? And alone or together? So there are some interesting trends happening. There's a, there's a trend, people stay closer to home. The likelihood of 20-somethings moving to another state has dropped well over 40% since the 1980s. So staying closer to home means also an increased opportunity that you will actually age at home. But the other thing is that um, 
21.5%. Uh, can we fix this before I end? I don't know. I thought it might just be the mouse picking up movement. I went through and reformatted. If anybody else knows PowerPoint, because I don't. Well, it has never happened to me, I know. It's never happened before here either. That's the thing. It's always the first time. So let's let's just try and you just you, you just get sneak previews to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just continue. So the other the other trend is this, that twenty one point five percent of young adults are living in multi generational households. This is the highest share since the nineteen fifties. So we are already creating multi-generational households. And the, the term which some of you might have heard is the boomerang generation. Are there any boomerangs around here or any old adults who have a boomerang at home? You have a boomerang at home. Yeah. So there you go, multi-generational households. And I'm sure it impacts the life of everybody at home. So but parallel to that and another uh, trend which is happening is that more people live alone and are single. More than 50% of American adults are single, a number that has jumped from 22% in 1950. So on the surface that, mean, that might mean that we now build like, you know, little apartments side by side or something like that, that people really live alone. But I think this is also an, an opportunity for people to defining new households, and especially in old age, uh, moving together and f shaping some sort of household with communal aspects. And I think there's great opportunity for all of us designers to accommodate these trends. <coughs> the other thing is where are we aging? Are we aging in suburban or urban environments? And despite the resurgence of downtowns, uh, and I have seen this also happening in my short time here in Kansas, the majority of households is still in suburbia. Nearly 80% of new households in the past decade were detached fam uh, single family homes. <coughs> and 46% of households 65 and older were suburban households in 2008. At the same time, 89%, and I'm sure you have seen this a couple of times, this AIA, ARP survey, in 2006, 89% of people wanted to age in their own home. Contrast this with only 0.6% of single family homes listed as accessible nationwide. So that means that, uh, this is, by the way, from a study of the University of Illinois, so that means basically that the majority of people age in a suburban home which is not accessible and doesn't serve them, or at least has the potential to not to serve them throughout their lifetime. And another important aspect about how we age, what is it? How, we, how are we getting around? Uh, are we using public transportation or are we individually mobile. And also here are some interesting trends. Uh, we drive less as a nation, at least for the time being. Uh, in general, Americans over 55 tend to drive less. This might not be surprising. But what is surprising is that young Americans are also driving less. Miles driven by 16 to 34 year olds dropped 23% between 2001 and 2009. I'm sure there are various reasons for it. Partially, you know, maybe uh, the recession kicked in during the time. But in addition, I would also think that uh, people are just tired of the car. Uh, they want to look for alternatives. They don't want to have the stress of being in the car. The car is not always convenience anymore. <coughs> and then look at, um, if we say people over 55 drive less, I didn't get the exact matching statistics, but people 65 and over right now account for 13.7% of the population. 
So there is a big part of the population which drives less. And then, of course, the part of the population which doesn't drive at all, the under 15-year-olds, about 20%. So this all to show that even though most of our cities are and our developments are designed for the car, a significant part of the population doesn't drive. But the car is still necessary for many of us to get around because during the last decades, we have built very neatly separated compartments uh, for our activities. We have constructed a compartment for living, we have constructed a compartment for working, and we have constructed a compartment uh, for shopping. So the car is the connector among <coughs> those compartments. And I would venture to say the more you are in the car, the less there's a chance that you actually connect with somebody from another generation. So the challenge for us is to overcome these barriers which we have built up over, over many years in the future. If we want to create a society which is truly multi-generational. And Kofi Annan, the um, Secretary General of the United Nations, I think said it very well. A society for all ages is multi-generational. It is age inclusive, very important, inclusive, with different generations recognizing and acting upon their commonality of interest. Another thing, the commonality <coughs> of interest. So how can we multiply these nodes of intergenerational connectivity and solidarity, both as designers, as spatial designers, but also as social designers? And both has to happen. This has to be an integrated process. So the hardware, I, you know, I consider everything which has to do with building and planning and zoning laws, how we can build from density to civic and public spaces, to public transportation, to mixed use building, to the housing types, how the houses are designed, adaptable floor plans, complete streets, which sort of take everybody into account from pedestrian to bicycle to car, to clear signage, to barrier free design. On the software side, these are things which either enhance or have to compensate of for what's happening on the hardware side. From social programs, to car sharing, to volunteerism, to the village movements, to block parties, to lunch group, to lifelong learning. And I think that uh, we in the States are especially good on the software side. And there are many innovative programs around here, but we have to catch up on the hardware side. But somebody is already catching up and creating grassroots movement. And it's not necessarily the boomer generations. This comes from, I would say, the 20-somethings and below. There are, there are urban movements uh, going on like walkability, bicycling, backyard farming, or community farming which really also change the city. And some of the changes are already in urban planning, like smart growth or uh, the complete street. But I think they, they go beyond that. <coughs> they also have you know, repercussions on the values of the housing and homes where we live. For instance, in, um, I saw, by the way, uh, Lawrence also has a walkability score but the green zones are only the downtown and the campus. So hopefully whatever will create, be created new will be the other green zone and maybe these green zones uh, connect at one point. But um, walkability has become a really important um, factor in the value of real estate in San Francisco. The other thing 
is partially because of the internet, I think, sort of the shifting boundaries between what's public um, and private, who we let in our house, pop-up restaurants, Airbnb, pop-up restaurants, for by the way, for whom who doesn't know it, it's people basically opening their house as a restaurant on an ad hoc basis and spreading the word through the internet. Mm. Airbnb, where strangers um, rent part of your house. The new thing, meal sharing, where you are able to, um, when you travel, find a home cooked meal in somebody's house. And then um, the last one is, and I left the French title with it because it sounds much better, is uh, Paris Solidaire, which was is a program from France where students uh, get room in an older person's, get connected with an older person who has too much space but needs help. The student gets the room for free uh, in exchange for a certain amount of hours of help uh, for the older person. And this, of course, is not just going on in France. So what I think that all these movements are part of the intergenerational movement and are part of what civic space is going to be in the future. Our homes are part of the civic realm as much as uh, the outside spaces. And how this, how the civic realm can come to us at times is also part of intergenerational living if we w don't want to go out. Another, another interpretation of this is that the way of urban living is actually coming to us even in uh, suburbia, but by urban living I mean the amenities of urban living, being able to walk to a restaurant, being able to walk to the grocer, being able to sit outside a cafe, go into a park, uh, that's all part of the amenities of urban living. And I'm going to show you now a couple of slides from uh, projects which all deal with the world coming, this, this civic realm coming to you. So one is uh, a project in Vienna, which is, has 75 units. <coughs> it uh, has a bathhouse, which is open 24 seven, which is also open for people outside the community. And it has uh, a great um, f uh, auditorium, which is open for concerts. There's a whole cultural um, group there, which plays this auditorium. And there, of course, there are outdoor spaces or outside spaces, which connect the people on their way out uh, on their way in, uh, help them to look across, or allow them to look across to their neighbor. It's, it's a way of life. They bring the world to them with all its amenities, but they're also a closely knit community, and the architecture contributes to that. The other one is an um, affordable housing project in San Francisco. And the interesting thing about this is it's an affordable senior housing project. And uh, attached to this is, is one of the new branches of the public library. So somebody who lives in the uh, housing project just has to go out the door and go into the next door and spend time in the library and connect with the general population. But their advantage is it's part of their building. The other one, and you wouldn't think that the Swiss are that extreme, but it is a Swiss example, is the combination of a sports arena with senior housing. <laughs> so I'm sure you, you can emphasize with this, I know there are a lot of sports fans here. So for somebody who is a sports fan, what a great place to be. They don't have to go far to watch the match. Uh, of their favorite team. And then, of course, part of civic life and part of the landscape is taking care, caretaking. So taking care of the young 
and taking care of the old. This is a small project in my home country in Austria, where on the left hand side, this is the senior housing and nursing home is part of it, and here is the preschool. So they are close together, they don't share one building, but they share the common grounds. And uh, people have told me that, for instance, for moms who bring their, or pick up their kids from preschool, afterwards they go and visit grandma in senior living. So again, this adjacency of different um, uses, it's really important. And then this is um, a project I was um, I was able to work on, which is uh, the Zen Hospice Project in San Francisco. Um, and I'm showing this here for two reasons. Number one, this is a hospice, a six-bed residential hospice in a regular San Francisco neighborhood. So hospice care is not somewhere out there, but it's part of everyday life. People know this is a hospice, and um, I think it's wonderful that it's part of the neighborhood fabric. And also that the outside, the outdoor, um, has become part of the care space. Uh, that's where a family can get together uh, with their loved ones, and it's very easy to get in and out, and it's you know part of the tradition of San Francisco backyards. And then this um, is not a nursing home, and I'm sure not all of you love this building at first sight, but uh, it's a pretty unusual project too, again, in terms of bringing aging into the, into the community and bring it into the civic life. This is a nursing home, a project in a um, medium-sized town in Austria, and they did an architectural competition for it. So there was already the value attached to having a home for their uh, ailing elder. And uh, it's in the center of town. So somebody who lives there, and sorry, I would like to have the same for myself, that I walk by the nursing home, I will most likely, because most of us will most likely at one time, sooner or later have, have to spend some time at least in a nursing home. I actually see this on my way to work uh, or on my way to the grocery store that it becomes part of civic life. But where the civic realm begins is, is in your home. Because if your home is not designed to support you, you can't even go out to the outside into the civic realm. And I have seen this many times that um, people make spaces. So an outdoor space or outside space only works if it has traffic, if it has people. So the core of uh, getting people out is having a home that supports them. This is a project we developed as a case study in our office to show that even in a 450 square foot apartment, you can actually design for healthy aging. And what I also mean by healthy aging um, is that you not only design for the outward signs of disability like falling or um, seeing, you know, a diminishing sight, uh, but you also design for the small parts of disability, which we all have in, in <coughs> one way or, the, or another. Like, we can't remember. We can't remember where we put something. <laughs> and bathing and dressing and toiletry in older age is not that fun anymore. So this should be the most comfortable and most supportive space. And the concept behind this is that every room is a living room. Every room is a is a room where you feel supported, where you feel comfortable, where you're able to sit down. And I also want to emphasize is that um, this is not just for a certain population. I would think that somebody who is 20-something and wants to do their exercises 
in the corridor that this would also be a very um, desirable place to be. And these are just some images of this little apartment with somebody doing exercise in the corridor with you see the shower beyond with the instead of grab bars you have climbing grips in them. Um, so bring some delight and fun into it and also a functionality. And then here again a view from the uh, bedroom to a work area in the kitchen because most of us work at home. The view into the shower again with the grab bars and then very distinct storage so you can find what you put away. A very different example from um, this concept of home is a project in Switzerland, which I think is very interesting because it was not developed for senior living per se. It got an award, an H award from the H Foundation in Switzerland. That's a foundation which gives every two years an award to a well-designed uh, project for uh, living at this part of life. And what they did here is they developed five multi-family homes. And each home has about uh, 16 apartments of different sizes. And these apartments are connected by walkways. You see this on the left here. And also by balconies. I think the tradition of balconies is a great one. And on the right hand side you have the way out of the garage, strong colors. So you, you not only take the light in your building, but also you know where you are. Uh, some image there which also keys you in. And what's also in, interesting though about this project, uh, when we look at the, at the program is that uh, it has daycare in there, it has workrooms for people to tinker. I think tinkering is an important part of many people's lives. And uh, it has, of course, some community rooms, but then it also has a, a care apartment. And it has a care apartment for eight people with dementia. And I think that's a really, really interesting part of this project that it's recognized that many of us will have dementia at one point. Uh, and the statistics right now in, in this country is that 50% of people over 85 um, have Alzheimer's. And they have integrated dementia living into this, um, into this project. So I think we have to look and create a new standard for, um, for living, for dwelling. Um, and the score we create from this is not just about age-friendly housing, it's about intergenerational inter inter housing, but it's also about better housing or homes for all of us. Age-appropriate homes, walkabilities, amenities, safety, social connection, and in an inclusive outdoor space. The glue which, how could this glue look, this outdoor space, which is easy, flexible, inviting, mutable. Does it look like this? Mm -hmm. A typical suburban street? I don't think so. Why doesn't it look like this? This is a residential street which a clear emphasis on people and not on cars. And um, having spent you know, the last night in Lawrence, Kansas, I think there are some actually great models here already in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, the old neighborhoods with the brick streets and sidewalks come pretty close to that. As a car, I definitely don't feel like this is completely my realm. I'm sharing it with many others. And what about the in-between? This is, I'm showing this as an example that even closeness can still create outdoor space or outside space can still become the, the connector 
and create opportunities for people to interact and intersect. This is, this is a very dense housing project in Berlin. And the space in between, these are different families living on either side. This is basically their yard. It's probably only 25 to 30 feet, but it's intensely, intensely used. They're calling it the big yard because it is a shared yard among all families. And of course, this is not for everybody. Uh, but I think it's a very interesting suggestion for <coughs> connectivity on a small footprint. And then another example, what about our front yards? Couldn't our front yards be also part of the outside that connects us? This is actually my own house in <laughs> Oakland, California. And last year, I decided my house is unusual from the neighborhood. It has a pretty wide setback. This is where my house is, and this is the front yard. I decided to do a front yard plaza. And I decided also that for now, I'm going to put a ping pong table there, which is accessible for all the neighborhood kids. Mm -hmm. And they come in, and they play with the <laughs> adults who rediscover their ping pong skills. <laughs> but later on, I can imagine that um, if the zoning laws become more flexible, which I think they should, you know, maybe later on, I do a pop-up Sunday cafe there. I sort of have this wish vision with the yellow umbrellas and little round bistro tables. So how to use your front yard, um, often just a green lawn. And then, of course, there are parks. Parks, you know, I, I think are the great connectors of every community. And uh, parks have, are going through a transition. Parks are not just anymore green lawns and picnic tables and trees, but they are now highly programmed, and they are really designed for specific groups. But even if they're designed for a specific group, like uh, this park in LA I just saw recently, which is this fantastic splash park for kids. An older adult can sit there and just be delighted uh, with kids having fun. And of course, parks are the source of well-being and wellness. And being for the being designed inclusively doesn't only mean that they're accessible with wheelchair, but they really the range of people have different ways to access this park I invited to do so, like here the yoga people in the park. So I want to come back for a minute to uh, the, the campus village. You know, how can this campus village right here, far away from the campus, how can it have this glue which uh, brings it together, all the diverse group in the campus village? The single family housing, the apartment living, the retail, and I assume there will be little cafes on site, the health satellite, the daycare, the university incubator. A park can be the glue, the outside space can be the clue which, glue which brings it together, where everybody has access. And I would venture to say that whoever has more difficulties getting access has to be closest to the park. So the nursing home and the assisted living, if this stays separate, should be close to the park. So what about creating this green swath, which becomes the seam of the, the seam which brings it all together, the zipper which brings it all together, and create access to it. And this won't look like this, but I just want to, I think it, just putting this here, you know, without keeping everything else the same makes a big difference. This is the civic pride. This is uh, the hub of, of activity. 
it's sort of the, I would call it the, whatever, the central park of Cap Campus Village. That's what Campus Village is known for. And I think it also, this has to happen in, or I think what would set it apart from others is not only this <coughs> park, this green swath, but also how it is programmed, how it serves all communities, but also that number one, it's designed for people, that this development is designed for pedest pedestrians and not for cars. And we looked a little bit about uh, how long would it take to walk the site. Uh, in general, people walk about seven to eight minutes. And I know that you know we won't walk like the crow flies, but I think it's doable if there's a central park in the village that this really becomes a connector. People feel comfortable walking to, and you feel comfortable sending your kid to. So that's what could happen in Central Park Campus Village, uh, a real melting pot of generations. I think there's a great opportunity. <coughs> Thank you so much. I'm sure that Susie will take questions now and we'll have a conversation. So um, I would like to begin this. One of the challenges is always to take these wonderful concepts and get somebody to actually spend money to live there. Yes. What kind of uh, experience, European and American, are you seeing in terms of actually getting people to invest in these kinds of multi-generational places? Or do there have to be incentives? Or how do you see that working? Well, I, I would say, you know, of course, the how, how projects are financed is very different in Europe than it's here. Uh, but what I know is that there are often uh, public and private partnerships uh, which come together. And I think this is happening more and more because the public side or political side recognizes that this actually saves health developments for healthy aging, actually saves money, saves the community money. <laughs> so uh, the more statistics you know, there are about the money saving aspect of healthy living, the more the, the you know, public side will be induced to go into partnership with private developers. And I think also from a developer side, you know, more and more, I think this is this whole, which really has nothing to do with intergenerational aging. There is just a general trend in housing with more amenities. And uh, for instance, in you know, in some cities, and not here, but in some cities, it's once the traffic has become so tremendous that once you're home, you're home. You don't go out anymore to the movie theater. So it becomes even more important to bring you know amenities closer to, to where people live. And you know, I see in the Bay Area a number of developments you know springing up like this. Use the term uh, homes for appropriate ages. Yes. And I've heard the term home for your lifetime or homes that can be repurposed so that as an older person sells that home, it's appropriate for a young person. Yes. But what is your meaning behind homes for appropriate ages? Well, it sort of goes back to this uh, what I said in the beginning that um, as we design, you know, for a longer life. Then you have to design not only for sort of the the dark, the completely dark moments, but you have to design for the full span of abilities and activities. So I would call this more a home which is inclusive <coughs> in the sense that it can, and this is m might sound more difficult than it is, but it's sort of designed for the highest standard of, how should I say it now, in a very positive way, in the, in the highest standard of needs. So that you don't have to retrofit a house 
after you get sick, but this house sort of takes into account that <coughs> all of us go through different phases. I mean, you might have you know a hip surgery and you might have to rehab for a month, and you're not going to redo your bathroom for this period, but that the bathroom from the very beginning is so easy and so comfortable to use that you don't have to worry about it. So it's not anymore about even permanent disability. It's, it's basically also reinventing the, the concept of disability, which the World Health Organization actually has done, where it says where it says that disability is really dependent on the on the context. So the more the context so if I feel disabled that it's not has nothing to do with me. It's part of the context. And I think this is part of how we, we have to change our design standards. And that's what I mean by age appropriate. Could we get back to the glue, please? Yes. Uh, <coughs> uh, one of the characteristics of that glue is a water feature. Yes. Because we all gravitate to water. Yes. Water is a part of uh, our whole lives and very important out here where we have droughty Kansas once in a while. Now we already have a water feature is there. Yes. So it would seem to me the water feature ought to be really enhanced in ways that it will create intergenerational interactions like fishing, for example. Or I can see, you know, somebody I'm running the boat. I'm taking my grandkids uh, fishing. Boats. They are so connected to that reality of fishing and catching something uh, that, you know, we just sort of blend together on that thing. So it seemed to me that a water feature, which also s kind of stretches all the way through, you showed that green swath that goes down to that pond. I would think that maybe a water feature in a green environment might be a very um, iconic kind of image for this village to take on. Yes, but it, it yes, <coughs> yes, and I think there's also the safety aspect. You know, if I was a mom, I want to not have to worry for my kid to fall into the pond. So, so, yeah. so but, but anyway, this can be solved. But I, I think actually this, you know, this, we're getting the details, but this splash parks, which are now, you know, popping up in various parks are uh, a wonderful, wonderful way for little kids to get wet in it. Yes. And it's super safe and it's super fun to watch uh, how much they enjoy it. I think, go ahead. Well, just in, in terms of what he's mentioning, but a fishing pond has algae and, you know, runoff chemical mixing from <laughs> fertilizer. Anything you're going to find as a glue has an upside and a downside. And there's economic implications to designing in that fashion. So what do you see are the more efficient glue pieces as opposed to, isn't this wonderful, but once we get into it, we find out it's just overwhelmingly difficult to manage? Well, I, I would think you know, the t two glue pieces I think are most important right now is even though if it's just the width of a street, you know, a one-way street or an alley, a green pathway which goes, you know, sort of bisects the site, which is sort of, and takes advantage of what's already naturally happening there. I think this is a really important thing, and it's important for me that it's not just on, in one part of the site, but it really stretches out so it, the access to it is very, very easy, but it's also a different way for people to get around the site. So this is one. And then the other thing is, I think, the, uh, the neighborhood streets, the arteries which go to the homes. I think this is another important glue in it that these really become people streets. So there are, and they're primarily for people, and then you know kids can play outside and the cars have to slow down. And I think this is also key for the younger generation, which has to be attracted to this kind of intergenerational project because it doesn't only work with older people, but we had some, you know, 
discussion this morning that it's clear that, you know, as a mom, you know, who's running the, around the whole day, what a pleasure if I can just open the door and let my kid go outside which, without having to stand at the window and worry about it. Here's a friend. Yeah. Uh, if you read what many economists are saying and you look at some of the reports about the savings of elderly, uh, it's reasonable to assume that not only will you have a higher proportion of population elderly, but you'll have a higher poor yes. proportion of elderly. And I was intrigued with your 450 square foot little uh, apartment. I'm curious if you've seen any other uh, examples of multi-unit or detached housing trying to scale things down to potentially uh, embrace a larger uh, segment of the elderly population. Well, we have we have done a, I, I was a, a consultant on a senior housing project close to San Francisco where we used actually this apartment as a model to create um, afford, affordable housing apartments. They were slightly bigger, 500 square feet. And um, so there are, and this was not, you know, what they wanted to do is sort of go beyond the pure uh, accessibility model of age-friendly housing. So by, by using this, and of course it was not exactly that, but uh, served as a model, by using this and uh, making the space flow better, we actually gained additional space in the apartment, which especially is also important in affordable housing to give people some way to customize the apartment, so we had sort of an extra nook there, which we were able to squeeze out and give them a choice to make this, you know, to customize this nook as their sewing counter or um, as a closet to store or whatever. But there was a, a level of customization, I think, and I think this is sort of an important aspect of this small, affordable living that even on this level you know, people get choices. And especially in affordable housing, uh, people move in as soon as they can. And for many of them, you know, this is the first time they actually have a decent home. And they are not going to move out there anymore if they don't have to. So they live there on the average between 20 and 30 years. Uh, so it's very important to make this as customizable, but also as rich in health features. So having a way or an incentive, nobody can force somebody else to do their ex daily exercises. But if you have a space in the apartment where the flooring is different, where walls are closer together, where you, you know, they sort of invite to make exercise, to do exercises at least you know, you have an opportunity. It's very much about uh, creating opportunities. And in terms of small apartments, what's interesting right now is that there's a whole wave of micro, they call them micro apartments happening in, for instance, the San Francisco Bay Area, which has to do sort of with yet another, you know, tech boom in the area. And the interesting thing for me is that they're actually all designed for young urban professionals. And I think it's sort of a missed opportunity to design them also for older people who would love to have, you know, live in the center of the city but can't afford a regular San Francisco apartment. But, you know, it's plenty of space for them. They would love a small apartment, but apparently this has not been taken into consideration. Yet. But I think it's a, you know, great opportunity. As an architect, have you found that it costs any more to do universal design than, uh, I don't know, obstacle field interiors? That's the, that we've had that kind of discussion. I yes. see some shaking heads, and I know we have some people who also have opinions, but I want to see what you think <coughs> about that. Because we would like for all of the housing to be universally designed interiors, to have universally designed interiors, and one of the question is, well, why would people want it if they don't need it, and doesn't it cost more? 
So can we address that with yeah. some help from the audience too? Yeah. So what I, I, you know, let me, let me sort of talk a little bit what I think is universal design in, in, in the context of a home. So number one is it should be easy for you to get in and out. Uh, that means just that you have to have um, one, one door in the house. It doesn't have to be your front door. Should be it should be level. You should be able to get in. The other one is uh, that doors in the house should be 36 inches. It doesn't mean that you necessarily will be in a wheelchair one day. But uh, the statistics I have here is that um, there's a 60, right now there's a 60% chance that a newly built single family detached home will he have at least one disabled residence. A 60% chance, so that's big. And disabled, of course, doesn't mean only wheelchair. You know, it could be also somebody in a walker. I mean, if you ever watch somebody trying to negotiate a doorway, a narrow doorway with a walker, and then, you know, knock their knuckles and, and scrape their knuckles, it's not very fun. So wider doorways make sense for a variety of reasons. And it also works with the um, universal design principle of having a wider margin of error. You know, that you don't have to shoot through the door straight on in order to get through, but there is sort of, uh, you know, some margin of error. And I would also see, say that, you know, at times a wider doorway can also be inviting in general just to leave your door open and connect rooms more in the house. Uh, so that's, that's another thing. But does it cost more? It costs, we talked about this the other day, uh, I can't give you now the exact, but it costs a couple of dollars more. Definitely less than ten dollars more, I would say, per door. And but compare this with the fact that you might have to move sometime just because the doorway is too narrow. So I think this is a good investment in the future. Um, I think also about visi visibility. Yes, visibility, of course. <laughs> yes, thank you. But you know, you have your mom visiting. You don't want to have to keep her out of certain rooms or, or something like this. You know, if she uh, is in a wheelchair or in a, in a walker and needs help. And then the other, the other two areas which I think need special attention in a universally designed home is the bathroom and uh, it's the kitchen. Uh, the bathroom, I would consider, can be very very easily universally designed. Um, yes, you can, you know, you can prepare the walls for grab bars. It's very easy. And I would people let let people know that the walls, you know, have what we architects call blocking in the walls so that in the future you can safely install grab bars. But also that when you a shower should be should be built without a curb. And that's really becoming more and more a very desirable feature for many people. They're now, I mean, I don't know how, how much I should go into details, but there are now trench drains, these linear drains, which can be put at the edge of the shower so water doesn't spill. And, and maybe the shower is also deeper so the spray doesn't come out. So this can be solved, definitely. And I can't give you now an exact price on this. Well, are you talking about new build? Or are you talking about remodeling? Well, because I mean, we're talking about new build. I mean, so right? It makes more sense out of the new gate new. to just universally design yes. it. It's very, very costly to. I mean, widening a door in some instances or putting a pocket yes. door can cost five grand simply because you have HVAC running through the wall, electrical, something like that. So we've definitely done those. It makes so much more sense to do it out of the gate versus having to go buy yes. a remodel because bathrooms alone can cost. I mean, if you're doing and you're ripping down to the studs anywhere from. Ten thousand dollars up to eighty thousand dollars, depending upon what people decide to do. do. It's all about materials and that type of thing. And the other big thing we see is stairs. <coughs> I mean, so if people are trying to get more room 
in a smaller space, like you know, where I live in Brookside, you know, we have very, very little space between the homes, so people build up versus out. And so that being said, if they're building new homes, you know, get the elevator in there. You know, a lot of people don't like to look at stair lifts. I get it. I don't think they're very sexy either. But but it, you know, addressing that as well. Um, and to your point, entry into the home, the kitchen, and the bathroom, all huge areas. Yes. And but I also. Do you think that universal design inherently is more expensive than optical based design? No. I don't think so. No. No. It's not. Well, like everything, isn't it sort of volume dependent? I mean, if, if that's all we did, all of a sudden the yes. cost would come down. Because yes, exactly. If this, became, if this became a building standard, yeah. then of course it becomes <laughs> cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think because of the aging factor, which we found in the, in the project we're working on in the Lake, is that uh, your cost is going to go down just like you said a while ago. The more the construction industry begins to shift and adapt to what's going on with aging, which there's, you know, there's 78 million people in America alone that's headed on that track. So if we're going to take advantage of that population, which 65% of the population is turning 65, and worldwide it's about the same number. So we as developers and contractors have to start looking at where the industry is headed. We're not going to keep building the same things because our lifestyles, because of aging, is going to change all that. Yes. So like in our development, we're building what a lot of us are familiar with is big house design. It's design, the apartments, the condos, the homes. If you want to move from your existing home into our community, you can bring all your furniture with you. You don't have to sell everything you have to move into the facility. So those are some of the things we're doing. And to answer your question about the water quality a while ago, we're, we've hired Applied Ecological Services out of Wisconsin. They were the firm that worked with Mark and the KC Metro 7 County Green program, started back in 04. But what we've done to save ourselves money and get better water quality, instead of having your, your normal storm water drain system, your big six foot walk through, drain systems and then a, a huge catch basin, which most developments you see now, that's what they have. And to address Dennis's uh, comment about the fishing, we'll have a 15 acre lake on that site, but it's designed so that we have none of the traditional stormwater systems engaged in the project. It'll all be through native grasses, native soil, soil construction, so that we do away with that. But the bottom line of it is that it ups your water quality uh, significantly over what your standard stormwater catch basins are today. And the cost factor is in this development is going to save us about 1.5 million. So it's a significant plus, plus, plus all the way across. So what we're saying to other developers is you've got to start thinking about better water quality, if you're going to build these type of developments, you've got to start looking at the lifestyle changes, but you, you also have to have better food intake, which in our site, we've got a 25 acre culinary production site that will be geared both to producing better quality vegetables. It'll do a lot of things in the farming community because your standard farming community is running $1,500 to $2,000 return on per acre. It could be less than that. But if you look at a culinary production market, you're at $25,000 to $35,000 per acre return. So there's a lot of things we're doing in our development that the standard developer is not looking at. It's a, it's a culmination of putting agriculture, suburbia, and a better lifestyle together all in one development. Very interesting. And I think that also brings up the point that sort of universal design is part of general sustainability. I agree. And I think that's really important uh, to keep in mind and it's part of the whole bucket of costs and how you shift, you know, the budget between the costs you know, makes the project. Well, that, the other thing that'll help the lifestyle too, which we're integrating into ours, is a totally, uh, what we call a virtual integrated village. It'll have all of the capabilities within the system, within the community that everybody wants. If they want it, that's fine. If they don't want it, that's great too. 
but as all the studies show, most of the most of the people that buy into a retirement uh, type community, whether it's intergenerational or not, the kids are basically the ones making the decisions as to what kind of facility they're going to move mom and dad into, aunts, uncles, grandparents. Right. So what we we're trying to do is make it sensitive to the fact that if the kids want to check on mom and dad, and mom and dad don't really want to be bothered every day, you will have the ability to do that through our technology. So there's a lot of things that will make your health and your living better really through technology. And there will be people that won't want the technology. If they don't want it, that's fine. They won't have it. But we're setting the whole project up so that it's top-notch technology. Scott, you had a question? Yeah, on the park and water feature in a proposed neighborhood, but I think I, I wonder, and I know, you know, not enough for hardly anything about this, is that, you know, how this will influence also how our streets are designed and how the interface between pedestrians and car, how this is going to be influenced by this. And I would imagine that this has some impact, yes, but I think it's a very interesting prospect. Well, it's one o'clock. We start on time and we end on time, but it doesn't mean we have to rush away, but certainly talk to Susie and others uh, before you leave. But thanks very much for coming all the way to Lawrence, and particularly the K-State students who are here. Uh, it's great to see you. We hope you'll come back, and I suspect um, we'll have your professor speaking in front of these think tanks before long, and so you'll have to come back again. So thanks everyone from Kansas City, Lawrence, Manhattan, other places too, I think. Uh, and we'll have another think tank before soon. So appreciate it very much.